so we're thankful for your, your uh, help and your, your participation in, in the mission of God. Now let's pray and transition to our message today. God, we thank you uh, for every person, uh, both big and small, who you call. We thank you that your sovereign hand rests over all of us to provide, to protect, and to produce in us the fruit you desire. Well, we pray that you would, on this Ascension Sunday, remind us that our hearts are lifted up, that we lift them up to where Christ is, to heaven, and that we have a place there, that our destiny is not in our flaws, in our mistakes, but in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read our passage together. Please rise as we read Exodus 4, 1 through 17. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put his hand out and caught, and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may be believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand inside, back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the, flesh of, the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put, words, put the words in his mouth, and I will be your mouth and with his mouth, and, with, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you uh, to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, on this Ascension Sunday, uh, when Jesus was lifted up, I thought it would be appropriate to, to give a message that lifts us up and encourages us uh, to, to look higher. Um, I don't know if I've told this story before, but uh, when I preached my first uh, practice sermon at seminary, and it was evaluated by my professor, uh, he said the one thing that he would say if you gave a bad sermon, he would have one positive thing to say, and that's what he said to me, you picked a good text. My second sermon uh, was in front of my uh, senior pastor at church, as a practice sermon, and it went even worse. I remember driving around after that first sermon, crying, um, wondering if this was my call, wondering if, if I was qualified for this. And then when that second sermon hit and I got bad marks the second time, 
um, I really wondered, is there a place for me in ministry? And, uh, you know, I had moved all the way from Texas to Philadelphia to pursue seminary education and to follow uh, God's call into the ministry. And at this point in my life, I seriously questioned whether uh, God knew what he was doing. Because, you know, the world uh, man has made, the world that we have made for ourselves, we elevate the impressive. We look to the skilled, the exceptional, the beautiful among us. And all of us, against that standard, we feel inadequate. But did you catch the call to worship today from 1 Corinthians? What did Paul say that we were? What did Paul say that, that most of us were? He said, not many of you were wise, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish, what is weak, what is low and despised, and what is not, so that no one can boast. So, if you're here, we're, I guess you're in the right place, because this is a place for all of us who are low. And that passage like this reminds people like me and people like you, maybe, uh, to answer God's call, no matter how we feel about ourselves. What all of this kind of leads us to is to look at uh, Moses' response to God's call uh, from chapter 3. Remember how God showed himself uh, uh, to Moses in a burning bush, and Moses is responding uh, he starts his response in, in chapter 3, but this is the, the part where he starts to really protest with the Lord. And we're going to see in this passage the reasons we can't move, the reasons we can move, and then finally the way that God moves us forward. Uh, you know, the, the right response, whenever, if God ever speaks to you audibly and he ever shows up to you in a burning bush, the right response, let me just give you the, the Cliff Notes version, is yes, Lord. No matter what it is you're feeling about yourself, no matter what you think about yourself, if the burning bush shows up, the response, the right answer is yes, Lord. But Moses, Moses has excuses. He actually uh, begins his re reluctance and resistance uh, in, in chapter 3 when he says, Who am I that I should uh, speak before Pharaoh? And, uh, you know, he says, But I don't know your name. Uh, these are all uh, ways of deflecting and resisting uh, God's call. But in chapter 4, we see him really kind of ramp up that resistance. And he says, uh, um, you know, he says, The elders, they won't listen to me. He says, I am slow of speak and, and tongue. And finally he says, Lord, just send someone else. You know, these are the, the, the reasons, the excuses Moses can't move is because he, he thinks he lacks authority, lacks acceptance, and he lacks ability. Now, we can be hard on Moses, but to be fair, he's right. He's not wrong. Uh, before Pharaoh, he is... Um, he's, a, he's an Israelite, first of all, and he's one who rejected Egypt. He was a prince in Egypt and rejected Egypt. Before uh, Israel's elders, uh, you know, they haven't seen him for 40 years. And when he left, he was a fugitive. And why was he a fugitive? Because he took on himself the role of judge and executioner, and they rejected him for it. Moses uh, says that he was slow of speech and tongue. Uh, the, the Hebrew here is sort of hard to decipher, uh, but it's literally heavy uh, with words and heavy tongued. Um, you know, uh, the, the, most scholars believe that maybe Moses had a, a speech impediment of some sort, which I relate to because I have a stutter that I work through. All of that, all of these reasons, all of these good and valid reasons to, to think maybe I don't measure up to what God needs, all of this adds up to an anxiety about going, an avoidance of the call of God. God sends someone else, and Moses doesn't want to move forward. You know, that is what often happens to us when insecurity uh, hits. It immobilizes us. It keeps us from moving forward. Maybe you don't struggle with inadequacy, and I don't know anyone who doesn't, uh, but maybe you're confident, maybe you're one of these people who, who never has met a, 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 a task he's not up to, 
uh, still, you have to question, are you moving where God is going in evangelism, in reconciling, in taking on the tough assignments at work or at home, in walking through the hard points and the hard paths with others? You might fail, you might do poorly, you might, you know, show how inadequate you are, uh, but anything worth doing, uh, this is some of the best advice I've ever received, is anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. Because it's worth being a parent or a spouse or a neighborhood evangelist or a person who does their work or a, a, a person who battles their sin or a person who serves in our ministries. It's worth being all those things even when you're not good at it. Even when it doesn't prove you qualified. I'm not saying you should try to do poorly or that it's okay to fail, that you shouldn't improve. But if you only move when you know you'll succeed, you will never move very far. And you will never go where God wants to take you. Before we get to all the reasons you should move forward, um, let's take comfort in the fact that God used Moses. He used the person who was reluctant. He used a person who was weak and flawed, who had a stutter. Let's take comfort in the fact that God has started his, his salvation project with, with Israel through a person like this. And he's given him reasons he can move. God uh, engages Moses in his excuse making, and we see three things. God provides, God is present, and God has a purpose. You know, God provides, he, he provides signs. He provides uh, uh, the, the truth that he's going to be his mouth. He's going to provide Moses the words. And he provides a companion, uh, 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 someone to go along with him, an Aaron. And all, God always gives us what we need. You know, there's a story about George Mueller, who, who ran an, a missionary who ran an orphanage in, uh, in England. And uh, he, he looked in the, in the cupboards and in the pantry and they were out of supplies to feed all the orphans. So he prayed, Lord, thank you for all that you will provide. And the next thing you know, there's a knock on the door, and the baker um, came by and said, you know what, the Lord just put on my heart that you guys need food. So he, he woke up at 2 a.m. And, and baked bread for the orphans. And then as soon as he put the bread away, the, the door knocked again, and, and the milkman was there, and his milk truck had, had broken down, and he wanted to give all of this milk away while his truck was being fixed so that it wouldn't go to waste. So God provides always the things that we need in the moment that we need them, and he shows this to Moses. He shows him the signs that will validate, authenticate his authority, his, his place before God. He gives him the words to speak. He's going to tell him, we already see in chapter 3, you shall say, you will say, you will say. Over and over again, God gives him the words. And all of that is to show Moses that he is present. He is in this mess with Israel, with Moses. The signs that uh, God gives to Moses, um, first of all, they were not to signs as signs to Egypt. They were signs, uh, these were the signs that Moses were, was to do before the elders uh, in Israel. And they were all signs not about Moses' authority, but about God's authority. He takes this staff and he throws it down and it becomes a snake. And then he picks up the, the snake again and it becomes a staff. What is that? That is the creator God saying that I have mastery over Egypt. The snake was a symbol of Egypt. And he had mastery over it. If that doesn't work, then show them a leprous hand. He puts his hand in his cloak, takes it out, it's leprous. And uh, leprosy uh, in, in the Old Testament covers a wide range of of skin uh, ailments. It was not uh, only limited to what we consider leprosy now. Um, but, you know, there was an outbreak of leprosy in Egypt's uh, day, in, in that day. And uh, Moses, God is saying to Moses, this is something that I have done. I have made their hand leprous. 
and I can take it away. Finally, the, he takes the water from the, if that doesn't work, if the second one doesn't work, then take water from the Nile and pour it out on dry ground. And when you pour it out, it will become blood. Symbol, you know, what, 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 all of these, the snake, the leprosy, the Nile, these are all things that uh, God had mastery over uh, Egypt. The Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt. It was the river that literally made them such a successful civilization. And it would become for them judgment and death. God was showing Moses that I will say to Israel that I have mastery. Not that you are impressive, but that God has power over Egypt. I will be going to war despite what you lack. I am able and thirdly, we see that God has a purpose. You know, God heard Israel's cry, as we, we read in chapter 3, and he remar remembered his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when Moses gets to the part where he says, God sends someone else, God's anger burns. It kindles against Moses. Why is that? Because Moses is focused. Moses reveals that what he's focused on is himself. He is looking at the man and not the mission. He is seeing uh, his limitations and not God's unlimited power. He's seeing where, where, how far he can move, where he can go, not where God can go. Because God always moves according to his will, not according to our ability. He is the burning bush, right? He's the burning bush. And what do we know about that burning bush? It burned with the bush, but it didn't need the bush. It wasn't consuming the bush as fuel. It was just burning with it. That is the God who is the I am. He doesn't need Moses. Moses brings nothing, as I heard one preacher say, Moses ain't had nothing but a stutter and a stick. Stutter and a stick is what Moses brought, and God used him. God doesn't need any of us, but he is with us, and he accomplishes his will through us because he wants to do it. His purpose is strong, and that is the biggest reason we can move forward. God already is. But it's interesting, finally, the, the way that God moves us forward. You know, if I had the power of God, and um, you should all constantly give thanks that none of us are God, for we would never be good as he is. And if I had his power, I would strong arm Moses. Or I would manipulate his abilities, give him superpowers. I, I would do something different than what God did. God doesn't wield his power to force Moses' hand. Instead, what we see him do is he, he challenges Moses. You know, I know he gets angry at Moses by the end, but each time he responds to Moses, he responds with a question that forces Moses to think. Who's in control here? What's in your hand? Staff? Let me show you what I do with that staff. Who made your mouth? You did. Isn't there, a, isn't there your brother Aaron? I know he speaks well. And constantly God is challenging our, our, our own notions of where our limits end, where, how far we go. Because God has surrounded us with his provision. God challenges us. He questions our own conclusions in his grace, that we could be exposed for what we really are, those who don't want to go, those who just don't trust God. You know, if you finally get to that place where you don't trust, you show you don't trust me, and I was God, then I would just be angry and smite you and find someone else. But God sends Aaron. It's almost like he gives in. He says, fine, you can use Aaron. You can use Aaron. You know, his response to Moses isn't his, his you know, you're, is, it, 
It's not to shame him for his self-doubt. It's not to tell him, you know, man up. Um, he sends a brother who would speak for him, speak with him, who would be by his side. And God does that for us. He gives us a, a greater Aaron. He gives us Jesus, whose words are because of him, and the, the words of God, the word of God is literally in us, living in us. By his spirit, and the spirit given to us will teach us, John 14 says, will teach us all the things that we, we need to remember. He'll teach us, and he'll be our mouthpiece. He'll show us all the things we need to say. That is what God has provided. He's given us the greater Aaron. And more than that, he's given us a bunch of lesser errands. A bunch of people around us who come by your side. You are not alone in your endeavor to follow God, to answer his call. You have all of the litany of God's people at your side. to Take that step forward with you so that you can walk forward uh, with another person doing it with you. Maybe we need to consider can I be an Aaron? But those, especially those of you who, who are confident, who do have abilities. Maybe you can be Aaron for another person. Send, be an Aaron. Don't just strong arm and demand people who, who, who owe you things and who, who aren't moving, who are frustrating you. Don't, don't just uh, force them, uh, coerce them, persuade them and guilt them, but instead provide, guide. What is it that Aaron does? He doesn't challenge Moses. He doesn't speak for Moses. He doesn't do it for Moses. He does what Moses tells him. That is a, that is a, a only biblical sense of leadership. That you would lead someone by doing what they say. That is stewardship and servanthood encapsulated in the Christian body. That we would go around and execute for others. Be their mouthpiece. And at the end, the thing that God does that's astonishing is that God still uses Moses. He uses Moses as he is. You know, Moses doesn't want to speak, but God says, you will be my mouth and Aaron will be your mouth. I will give you the words and then you will be as God to him. He still plans to use this guy who's inarticulate, slow of speech, slow of tongue, unwilling, no authority, no credibility before Israel. And he still plans to use him. And we know that because at the end, God says, take your staff. Don't forget your staff. What would God use to do his wonders what would God use to demonstrate his authority? God uses what Moses already has in his hand, his staff. God uses what Moses already is. He's a shepherd. So don't forget your staff. People of God, don't forget that God is going to use what you are already doing. He's going to use the things that you are involved with. Uh, we need to see what is in our hands and not forget to bring it. Not forget to take our stuff with us because God wants to use your computer programming. I don't know how. I don't know why. God wants to use your marketing skill. God wants to use your accounting know-how. God wants to use uh, your real knowledge of the real estate market or your parenting experience or your struggle, the experience that you had uh, putting your parents through their, the, the end of their lives, uh, caring for the aging. He wants to use your experience getting over your wounds. He wants to use the things that you already have in your hands. Who you have become in your life already. Don't forget your staff. Because God can use it. This is God's work. You know, the thing that eventually got me over my uh, through that dark period where I was questioning my call. The thing that eventually moved me out of that season of, of self-doubt and insecurity was I, I read an article from Peggy Noonan. It was about Peggy Noonan and her advice uh, to, uh, to young communications students and um, 
if you don't know who Peggy Noonan was, she was uh, she became a, a, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and an Emmy Award winning journalist. But before that, she was a um, she was a speechwriter for Ronald Reagan. And of all things, Peggy Noonan was uh, fraught with stage fright growing up. And uh, as she, you know, kind of built these skills as a speechwriter, she still struggled to go in front of people and give speeches, which was the irony. Until one day she considered, you know, she had been focused on what people would think of her, how they would think she looked, how, how they would, you know, see, judge her for the way she moved and acted and sounded. And then one day it occurred to her that they didn't come for her. They came for the message that she was going to give. They came to hear what she had to say. So it was the message and not the man that mattered. It is the mission and not your qualifications that matter. We are not the message. God's program is not to make us feel good about ourselves, but to make us understand how he moves with us. We have an important thing to do in this time of crisis in this nation during a pandemic, when people are starting to divide, the fractures are very clear. We have an important thing to do, to speak for God. And God is doing it with us. Only don't forget your staff and let's move with him. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us. Uh, you know, when, when we do things, Lord, we have no idea whether they worked or not. The results are usually a mystery to us. But Lord, we know for certain that you will accomplish your will through us. We know for certain that in obedience, when we walk forward, Lord, you redeem the world. Let us put our thoughts, our eyes, not on ourselves, not on our limitations, nor on the response of this world, but upon you, the God who cannot be stopped, whose purposes cannot be thwarted, whose words will never come back without accomplishing what it set out to do. Lord, let us put our thoughts to you, our faith in you, and strengthen us this day when we know the Lord is interceding on our behalf in heaven at your right hand, ascended to the throne, that we might have all things, all spiritual blessings because of him. Give us then confidence today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.